instrument left and then it's going to be aligned and they're going to start taking pictures. Oh my god, I can't wait. Oh, fantastic. So welcome to Space According to Skylar. I'm Skylar. I'm an astrophysics PhD student. I love talking about space and I wanted to do it more and have more time to do it. So I am adding YouTube to my uh, whole social media science communication thing. Um, you can check me out on TikTok here. That's where I made my start. But today we are talking about the one and only James Webb Space Telescope. This video is going to be broken down into three parts. We are going to talk about kind of the design of James Webb. We are going to talk about the science goals of James Webb and what it's going to look at. And then we're going to talk about where it's at now and what the next steps are, because we're getting so close. So this is James Webb Space Telescope. It consists of one telescope with a primary mirror and a secondary mirror, and then four different detectors that will be able to look at different wavelengths of light and do different things with those wavelengths. So let's break it down. The primary mirror of James Webb, this big gold hexagonal thing, is six and a half meters across. That is almost three times larger than Hubble Space Telescope. And the reason it's so big is because we are looking at a lot of really faint objects. And so you want a large surface area so you can capture as much light from those objects as possible. The other benefit to having a really large mirror is your resolution. The larger the mirror is, the more detail you can see in your images. So the bigger the better. But there's a problem, because we had to get James Webb to space, and you do not have any rockets in existence that are that wide, six and a half meters across. How, how are we going to get this thing up there? And that is where the sort of beehive shape of this comes into play. Because what they had to do was build James Webb and then fold it all up. Because you cannot take a six and a half meter telescope and put it in a rocket as is. So they had to fold it all up, put it in the rocket, launch it, and then unfold it all once it got into space. There's a very cool video that I'm linking in the description that shows how this unfolding process actually happened. What's super cool is that because of where James Webb is going to be, all of this unfolding had to be done via various mechanical signals. It wasn't like there were astronauts up there actually pulling the mirrors apart. And this is because unlike Hubble, which is in orbit around the Earth, James Webb is going to be at a Lagrangian point. A Lagrange point is just where the gravitational pull of the Earth and the Sun cancel out. So normally, the further away you get from the Sun, the slower you orbit. Pluto is orbiting much, much slower than Mercury. So if you were to move further away from the Sun than Earth, your things are going to sort of lag behind the Earth as we go around the Sun. However, at a Lagrange point, the Sun's gravitational pull and the Earth's gravitational pull balance each other out. Now what this means is that instead of moving at a longer orbital period, something at a Lagrangian point will move with the same orbital period as the Earth. It will take one year for that object to move around the Sun, even though it's located at a different distance from the Sun than the Earth is. So where James Webb is, is 930,000 miles away from the Earth on the opposite side of the Sun. And so it will orbit in lockstep with us, so we'll never lose touch. Being 930,000 miles away from the Earth means it's very difficult to do anything to James Webb once it was launched. Everything has to be done remotely. And so all of the reverse space origami that happened just came from little fuses that we set off that let the mirrors open up. It's really an engineering marvel. So we have James Webb Space Telescope, a six and a half meter mirror orbiting 930,000 miles away from the Earth. And it is going to be taking images of our universe. But something that's important to note is it's not going to be taking images and light ranges that are visible to our eye. In contrast with Hubble, which took images in the visible range of wavelengths, so from about 0.4 to about 0.7 micrometers, one micrometer is 10 to the negative six meters, James Webb is going to be working in the infrared, which goes from about 0.7 to about 28 micrometers. That is to say the infrared wavelengths that James Webb will be detecting, infrared goes out longer than that. Now the benefits of looking in the infrared I will talk about more in the next section, but it is important to note that for all of the detectors that are on it, they will only detect light in those wavelengths. 
Now, it's really important to note that you could have James Webb Space Telescope, you could have the big fancy mirrors and everything perfectly aligned and it would all come to nothing if you didn't have all of the instruments that are on it. Because it's these instruments that actually trap the light that James Webb focuses and then sends it back as signals to Earth so we can analyze and interpret them. As I mentioned before, there are four of these instruments. You have the near-infrared camera, the near-infrared spectrograph, the mid-infrared instrument, and then the kind of fine guidance and slitless spectroscopy instrument. You'll notice that there's both near and mid-infrared instruments. Near goes up to about 5 microns, mid goes from 5 to about 28, so that's the only difference there is what wavelengths of light they're looking at. Then you also have imagers versus spectrographs. Imagers are what's actually taking the pictures. They're taking in all of the light and telling us what it looks like. Every single picture that we are going to see from James Webb is going to come from one of these cameras, either in the near or mid-infrared. But we also have spectrographs, and what spectrographs do is they take the incoming light and they split it up into its individual wavelengths, and they tell us how much light we're getting at each wavelength. And so you'll get something that looks kind of like this. We use spectroscopy, which is this technique, to learn about the composition of the universe because you can look at the different peaks where you see a lot of light at specific wavelengths and that tells you what elements are there. So James Webb is equipped with instruments that can do both imaging and spectroscopy in all of the different wavelengths that we have talked about. So it's going to see a lot. It's super exciting. Thus equipped with our giant mirror and our four instruments, what is James Webb actually going to look at? Why is everybody so excited about it? Well, the answer to that is um, a lot of different stuff. James Webb has enough fuel reserves to keep it working for at least 10 years. So we've got about 10 years of data upcoming. It's so exciting! Now, there are tons of projects that have already been approved for this kind of first cycle of James Webb imaging. Um, I'm just going to talk about some of the general themes and trends what we can use this big infrared space telescope for. For me, as an extragalactic astronomer, one of the most exciting things James Webb is going to be used for is looking into the early universe. To understand why infrared will allow us to look at the early universe, the first thing that we need to know is that looking further away is the same thing as looking further back in time. And this is because light takes time to travel. Light travels at a speed of 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second, which is really fast, but considering the scales of the universe, not actually that fast. The closest star to us, Alpha Centauri, is a little bit over 4 light years away, which means that it takes 4 years for light to get from that star to our eye. And that's the nearest star to us. Just imagine how long it takes for light from other galaxies to get to us millions of years, usually billions. So observing distant galaxies is the same thing as observing early galaxies, because their light was emitted when the universe was much younger than it is right now. Okay, but where does infrared come into this? It has to do with the fact that the universe is expanding. Our universe is getting actually stretched apart. And not only is this stretching apart the distance between galaxies, it's also stretching the light that is traveling to us from those galaxies. We call this effect redshift, which is when an object is moving away from us, the light that it produces gets stretched into redder and redder, aka longer and longer, wavelength. The further away your object is, the faster away from us it is moving, and thus the more redshifted the light gets. So really distant slash early galaxies get redshifted into super long wavelengths. For some of those galaxies, that means that the light they produced was redshifted out of the visible range entirely and into the infrared, which is why having an infrared space telescope is so cool. It's going to let us see galaxies that have been redshifted out of the visible range of light into the infrared. Galaxies that would have been redshifted this much are the ones that are really far away. So James Webb is actually going to be able to see way more of the universe than Hubble is, and it's also going to be seeing way more of the early universe than we have ever seen before. So a lot of the primary targets of James Webb are just early galaxies. We want to see what is out there when the first galaxies were being created, and James Webb is going to let us do that. 
which is so cool. Within this general field of early galaxies, there's a lot of other things that James Webb is going to look at, but it all has to do with what's happening in the early universe, so we'll leave it at that. An infrared telescope is also useful much closer to home, because infrared light can get through dusty regions. When you look up at the Milky Way, all of these dark patches are dust, and that dust will block the light that is coming from behind it, if you are looking in visible wavelengths. But if you're looking in infrared wavelengths, the dust won't block the light, and you'll actually be able to see through it into regions that we haven't been able to see before. Regions that have a lot of dust include where stars are being formed, where planets are being formed, and general galactic structures. So we're going to be able to get to see a lot of new things that we haven't seen before because dust has been blocking our view. These things really just scratch the surface of what James Webb is going to look at. There are hundreds of approved programs, and I can't get into them all here. But if you're interested, I'll put the link in the description so you can see what scientists want to do. So that leads us into our final section. What is James Webb Space Telescope doing now? James Webb was launched on December 25th, 2021, and today is March... nope, April? Shoot. Time is a construct, y'all. And today is April 3rd, so it has been out in space for over three months. In that time, it has successfully unfolded, it has done the reverse origami, and it has begun calibration. In fact, it has calibrated all but one of its instruments successfully. The final thing that is happening right now is a cooling down of the mid-infrared instrument. Once that is done, they will do another calibration check of all the instruments, and then begin actually collecting data. The first program of early science is supposed to start in early June, and so we might get images from James Webb, besides just the amazing different calibration images and selfies that we see here, in like two months! It's so exciting. Astronomers have been waiting for this for like three decades, so we're, we're all pretty stoked. So there you have it, just a little overview of James Webb. Now if you liked it, please like, follow, subscribe. What are all the different things that you say on YouTube? Leave a comment, like, subscribe, share with your friends. If you have any video requests, things you want me to spend a little bit more time on than I can on TikTok, please let me know. I would absolutely love to. And of course, stay tuned for more updates on James Webb.